Today's topic, first thing we're gonna go through, is the first of a two-part series entitled, The 10 Biggest Mistakes Investors Make When Buying Foreclosed Homes, or how Homes in Foreclosure. Uh, we're gonna go through this, like I said, and, and there's, there's 10 things, I'm gonna go through five today, five probably tomorrow, but it's, uh, it's an interesting topic because there are a lar large number and a significant uh, number coming on the market now of foreclosed properties that uh, somebody's gonna buy or they're gonna go back to the bank. And there's a lot of reasons for that. It goes back to the forbearance agreement we had during COVID uh, as being probably the main thing. A lot of those people went to the end of the forbearance and now I've popped their payments. Uh, and these lenders, as you might imagine, after not getting paid for three years or two years, are less than uh, amenable to extending that. So those are in foreclosure. Number two, we're, we've got this recession thing that we're either in or going into, and that is causing additional people to fall behind on payments. And once again, uh, the banks are less than likely to extend those. Why? Because a lot of those loans are lower interest rate loans. A lot of them are in the 3% range, 4% range. There's even some 2.5% money out there. So if you're a bank and you have a chance to foreclose on 3% money that you've loaned, get that house back, get your money back, and then turn around and loan it out at 6 or 7%, doubling your yield, why wouldn't you do that? So this go-round, there's going to be less forgiveness from uh, the banks in terms of foreclosure. So it's a, it's a topic that is definitely timely and it is something that you need to be aware of if you're going to be in the foreclosure business uh, but the, it, there's some pitfalls there's some biggest mistakes that all beginners uh, medium range investors and even experienced investors like myself have to go through or need to try and avoid going through so that you can uh, get a successful buy a successful property first thing up is hidden debt when you buy a property that's in and I and I'm gonna focus on properties that are in the foreclosure process that have not been auctioned off yet to somebody else. They're not, they haven't gone yet back to the bank called an REO property. It used to be called an Oreo property, other real estate owned properties. We're not gonna focus on that. We're not gonna focus on the auction. We're gonna talk about the pre-auction type of properties. That's where your best move is if you wanna get something relatively inexpensive with some equity in it and potentially with very little to no down. Uh, it's gonna take some because you'll probably have to catch up the missing payments. But the first thing that you need to be aware of when you're doing that is the debt that is involved with the property. Now, most of us think, okay, there is a first from Bank of America or Wells Fargo or something like that that they're behind on. But oftentimes there's a second out there, a HELOC they're commonly called. And, they're, and, and those are voluntary loans. So typically you've gotta make sure you run the title so you, you know what's there in terms of voluntary. The other thing, the thing that catches most people in the neck is what's called an involuntary lien or loan. So an involuntary would be something like child support. Uh, it could be something like property taxes that are in default. These are things that are forced onto that home as a result of that seller owning that home. They have nothing to do with the property itself other than they, they are priority liens. And in other words, they get paid before the bank gets paid. So a lot of that stuff is not on a normal title search, a quick title search. If you were just to run something on some of these uh, things that you can do from home, you may just see the Bank of America or Wells Fargo loan. You may not see that they owe 32,000 in child support and they're behind $10,000 on property taxes. You have to know that uh, and you have to research that because when you buy one of these things, you're buying it subject to all of that debt. Now, going through the, for the actual foreclosure process, the auction, all of that stuff is paid off or extinguished. But when you buy before the auction date, you've got to be aware of all this stuff. So how do you do that? How do you find out exactly how much voluntary and involuntary liens are on a property? Best thing to do is contact your title office or, or your customer service department of your title company and have them run a preliminary title report for you may cost you a little bit of money. It's well worth the money spent because you will avoid problems on the other end of the deal. So you need to know everything that's on there. Don't believe what somebody tells you, especially the seller. Okay, number two, taxes. We talk about property taxes and you generally can be aware of that. Although every state and every municipality have different ways of accounting for property taxes. So for example, <clears throat> there's one market that I'm in uh, where we do a lot of rehab properties and every time we buy a property, we must pay the entire year's taxes in advance, a whole year. Even if we're on day two of the new year, it's already been paid, we still gotta go out and pay 
the entire next year when title transfers in that state. Others prorate things. And now you'll get it back as a proration when you sell, but you got to know what those numbers are because I guarantee those tax people are going to be coming after you and they're going to be holding their hand out looking for that kind of thing. Another kind of taxes that will catch you in the neck if you're not careful, something like a state or federal tax lien. IRS uh, don't necessarily record, uh, or if they do, they don't necessarily have a number listed with them. So you've got to do that preliminary title report to find out how many dollars are owed to the government. Now, in some cases, uh, you can get the IRS to pass on that property, uh, but only if there's very little equity on those kinds of things. It's hard to get them to get off of that property. These would be taxes that would have been wage earned or garnered at a personal level that then after a period of time they don't get paid and they slap that lien onto the property or any property that's owned by that debtor. In this case, the seller of the home you're trying to buy. That's number two. Number three, deferred maintenance. Uh, in a lot of cases, you know, buying a foreclosed property, you've got a homeowner who's not been maintaining the house, right? So they're not, if, if they don't have money to even make the mortgage payment, they're not taking care of the termite issues. They're not worried about the leak in the roof. They're not worried about rats in the walls. There, there's all kinds of things that happen that you need to be aware of. And so I'd always recommend, if you're dealing directly with a seller, getting a full property inspection. We always recommend this on any property that we either are gonna flip or keep, uh, which is basically everything, uh, unless you're gonna wholesale it which is very hard to do when you're in the foreclosure business. And I'll talk about that on the next call. But just as a general rule, the maintenance is that's we call deferred maintenance, the maintenance that should have been done that's not been done yet, is probably an issue you need to look at. So that, and that brings us to number four, which is greedy or dishonest sellers. They, you know, these are people who missed payments. Um, in, in many cases, these folks, unfortunately, have had bad financial situations. It could be anything from the usual things like death, divorce, taxes, bankruptcy, job loss, medical issues, having to move family issues, or it could be something, you know, more sinister, like they're just not making a payment because they're planning to stiff the bank and live there as long as they can and then move on. But no matter what, whatever their situation is, they are more than likely, if they're not making their payments, they're more than likely to not be totally truthful with you when you're negotiating with them to buy that house. Why would they? They don't have they stand to get nothing out of the deal or very little out of the deal. So it's not in their best interest in a lot of cases to be truthful. And people, frankly, you know, who aren't able to uh, make their payments and pay their bills, you know, ha lying becomes part of the deal. I mean, it's how they survive. They're borrowing from Peter to pay Paul and they're juggling whatever they can, you know, using various methods to try and pay things. But at some point they throw up their hands and they just say, forget it, I'm, I'm done. And you know, they may or may not be truthful. Now I've done a lot of this type of property. I bought a lot of this property. I can think of one time when I dealt with an honest seller. And even with that, there were some things that they didn't disclose that they should have. And I never really reconciled whether they knew this or they didn't know this information. And nonetheless, in most cases, the old adage that I always ascribe to, which is all sellers lie all the time, is probably true here, but even more so when somebody is running from the, the tax ban, so to speak, running from the lender, trying to avoid uh, doing things. Now these folks, they don't answer their front door, they won't pick up their phone calls, they'll change their number, they don't, they shred their mail, um, you know, they ignore everything. So getting straight information from a, a seller who's in a bad condition, even if it's not of their own making, and most of them aren't, uh, like I said, lying just becomes a way of life for them. It's a way to manage and to get to tomorrow. So be careful of that, be aware of that. Anything you hear coming out of their mouth is generally not uh, truthful. So, and they've got nothing to lose. And the fifth thing is holdover occupants or holdover tenants. So if you buy a foreclosed or property that's in the foreclosure process, you wanna make sure you don't close it until and unless it is empty. Now, most times these are going to be homeowner occupied properties. So it's fairly easy to find out. If they're moved out, they're moved out. And there are a lot of ways that you can make sure that they're out before you complete the purchase of their property vis-a-vis -a, -vis a foreclosure, pre-foreclosure buyout, or what we call equity buyout. It is just to do something like cash for keys. You wanna make sure they're out, you say, listen, 
I, there's no equity here to pay you anything, but I'll give you $3,000 the day you move out. And you have somebody meet them there, you make sure all their stuff's out, you make sure they get the keys and the locks are changed immediately, and then you give them the money. And um, you know, you don't want them to hold over. Why is that? Well, we've had some horrible situations during COVID, and you probably have seen these things in the national news. There was one tenant in New York that literally lived 32 years uh, in the property without making payments. This was a, a renter um, and somebody bought the property and has never collected rent in 32 years. Finally, after uh, dozens of court cases, uh, the state of New York had the sheriff or constable, whatever they are there, go and physically remove that person. Um, it happens all the time. We had a situation last year during COVID or about a year and a half ago, probably two years ago now, uh, where somebody sold their house, they were in foreclosure, somebody bought it, wrote a check for cash that they had. It was around five or $600,000. I think it was 600,000 uh, bucks down in Southern California and the seller would not leave. They claimed COVID status. Now, they owed nothing on the property except taxes and they were behind on the taxes. So they got all $600,000 and then they wouldn't leave. And it took something like a year to get these people out. They did everything they could, including going to the news and so on and so forth. And all these folks did uh, was just never answer the door, never answer the phone. Nobody let, you know, always left somebody in the property, they had to go to the store. The husband would go to the store and the wife would stay there. Nobody, they never completely left the property. And so, you know, they got away with a year or a year and a half of essentially free living. And they had $600,000 in their bank account. So this stuff does happen. These are kind of extreme examples, but I have seen this happen and I learned this early on from my mentor, Ron Legrand, and he taught me, which practice I believe in absolutely, and I, I, I've had it be successful more times than not. You don't give a check, you don't pay any money, you don't do anything with the old seller until they're gone. If there's a tenant in there, a lot of times, uh, although it is less frequent than an owner occupied, sometimes you've got non-owner occupied properties and it may be their tenant, could be their cousin, their nephew, their grandson, something like that that's not living in there. Once again, you're gonna have to address that situation with that occupant and say, listen, uh, I'll give you some money, cash for keys it's called. I'll give you some money if you leave. The minute you're out, you give me the keys, I give you the cash. And you gotta do that. <clears throat> if it's a non-owner occupied, a lot of times, the seller of the house who doesn't live there can't get that tenant out and they've stopped making bank payments and so the property's in foreclosure um, you know and it's a horrible situation but the worst thing you can do is to put money into something and then you've got this tenant whether it's the seller or their tenant uh, staying in that property and you'll have to forcibly evict them and depending on what state you're in that's a long and tedious expensive and horrible process can take a long time and it will definitely tear up most if not all of the profit you may have expected to make on that property. So anyway, that's my first five of the 10 biggest mistakes that buyers make, uh, investors make when they buy foreclosed properties. We're gonna talk tomorrow about some of the other things, including some of the state laws. They vary all over the place and we'll get you a little more information on that topic tomorrow. Okay, thank you for watching. If you get a minute, I would love to hear your comments about what you think of these videos. Feel free also to put in any topics down here in the comment section of things that you'd like to hear me discuss. Any questions you want, go ahead and put in here. We'll make sure we get a video on it when we get time. And as always, please like and subscribe. Hit that ring the bell button as well to get notified every time there is a new video. Thanks a lot, everybody.